morning, Orchard family and friends. Nice to see you as you walk on in. If you're out in the lawn, come on in and worship together with us. Glad that you're here with us. A lot of announcements in the bulletin today. If you didn't get one, they're right outside. Uh, take a moment and take a look. There's a lot of things going on for all kinds of different events and something for everyone, I think, here. If you don't get our weekly email, uh, please write that on your connection card and we'll be happy to get you started on our weekly email where you get all of our announcements and encouragement from our, from our pastor, from our interim pastor, Arnell Motts, and our pastor who will be returning in September, uh, Pastor Asad Saif. We got some news. A group of our folks, Orchard folks, uh, went down to Rancho San Juan Bosco in Tecate and had a great success. They were terrific encouragement to the orphans there and to the leaders. Here's a picture of the crew. And the GO team will be going back um, in the future. So if you're interested in an orphanage trip, a one-day trip, they'll be scheduling more of those to encourage the orphans, eat with them, and then do some minor uh, fix-up tasks at the facility. So there's a GO team table out on the lawn and you can get more information there. In other news, you may have been here for our mega garage sale yesterday, and we all uh, had about five different teams pitched in together and made over $1,400 for the building fund. Yay! All right. <laughs> Worth a clap, uh, applause for sure. So the... Um, the bucket's out there in the lobby, and the, um, the number on that is not correct because the 1400 is not added in yet. So all the things that you see, that you see we're working on, making progress here, it feels so nice and cool in here with the air conditioning working. We just added air conditioning to the nursery, 
And the moms and dads are very happy about that. The babies are happy about that. And all that matters as we, um, as we build this place to serve our Lord. It's all about that. So next Sunday is our children's ministry open house right after church. And everyone is welcome, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, friends. Come out and check out what all the exciting things that are happening in the children's ministry. And ladies, there's a table out, out on the lawn also for our ladies fashion show, Tea and Boutique. That's going to be held August 20th. It's come as you are. If you want to dress up, great. If you want to be California casual, great. We'll have a vintage resale boutique fashion show with many of your friends from Orchard being models and some delicious snacks as well. So uh, don't miss the opportunity to invite a friend to that event. It's going to be super. We're also so, just so blessed and grateful that the Wham! Whip Worship Arts and Music Program is coming to Orchard August 15th, and that's a children's choir and drama program for children age four all the way up to grade six. They're going to meet uh, every Monday uh, in the evening and practice, culminating in a Christmas performance, great big Christmas performance, and then some other performances along the way for Veterans Day and other, um, and other holidays. So if you know... Uh, a parent who wants to get their child involved in this, uh, they are taking signups all the way until August 15th when they start. And we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. We have a way for you to communicate through our online um, prayer request. But also, you have a card in the pew in front of you, a co connection card. Please take a moment, and if you have a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. They can be confidential, or you can come on up after the service for prayer. Um, put it right there in the basket, and we'll join you in prayer. And now it's time to worship together. Good morning, church. Glad to be worshiping with you this morning. So let us worship God, our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We desire to seek our God in his holy temple. We have come with shouts of joy to sing and make music to the Lord. So let us worship God in spirit and in truth in this hour of worship as we bless his name. So would you stand with us as we sing and bless his name together? Forgiven, I said. 
This morning as we worship our God, um, I'm going to introduce, it might be a new song for you all, some of you might know it, um, but it speaks of God's mercy, and I know, I don't know how many of you know, I have two kids, I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, which requires some patience, and I know all of you parents are aware of that, and people say, you know, when you get married, you realize your selfishness. And when you have toddlers, you realize your impatience. And it teaches me about God's everlasting grace, his mercy, his loving kindness. He does not say to me, you know better. Stop doing that. You know, he says, I love you. I love you. I forgive you. Your sin is as far from the east as the west. And so we sing to that God this morning who his mercy is never ending, it's never failing. And so let's sing this together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is mine.
So God, we sing of your mercy this morning. We sing of your grace that covers all things. And so God, would you forgive us for the times that we repeat the same things over and over and over again, neglecting you and turning from you and turning to our own ways and trusting in our own understanding. God, give us grace. Have mercy on us. And forgive us as we seek you and as we strive to seek you with all of our heart. And so, Lord, we rest in your grace. We rest in your promise that you give us new life, that your mercies are new every morning. And so we praise you for that in Jesus' name. the chorus that says, what a powerful name, because how many know there's power in the name of Jesus, amen? Sometimes we don't know what to say, but sometimes I feel like I could just call out Jesus, and everything's going to be all right, amen? Join us as we sing this song.
we sing your name this morning, Jesus, we know at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so we confess your name now. We declare your name and its power and its wonder and its goodness. And we worship you in all of this. We give you our hearts. We give you ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, happy people. My name is Fred Franklin. I'm going to be uh, bringing you our scripture reading this morning and our uh, prayer time uh, for this morning together. So our scripture reading is going to be out of the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 9. We're just going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. And we thank God for the reading of his word. Church, please pray pray with me. O God, what a powerful name it is, Lord Jesus. We thank you, O God, this morning for bringing us uh, together uh, one more day, giving us another opportunity, Lord, to praise you. Oh, God, you are the creator and the preserver of all mankind. We pray to you, oh, God, for all sorts of conditions of every people um, anywhere on this planet, that you would be pleased to make yourself known to them, oh, God. Reveal yourself to them. Let your saving grace to all the nations and around the world be apparent, Lord God. More especially, we pray for your church this morning, O God, your holy church, that you may be, that it may be guided and governed by your spirit, by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold faith in unity of spirit, Lord God. And we'll be careful to praise you today for your fatherly goodness, O God, all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed this morning, oh God, wherever they may be right now in the name of Jesus, we pray for them. We pray for their minds, Lord God, their body, their entire being, their person, especially uh, for those whom our prayers are desired, for those who we may have on our prayer list, that it may please you, God, to comfort and relieve them according to their, all their different necessities, Lord God. You know what they stand in the need of giving them patience under their suffering and a happy issue out of all their afflictions, O oh God, troubles they may have, whatever comes their way. Today, O oh God, we pray together as a church for all the families, for the parents, O oh God, for all the ch- children, for the care of the children. Lord, this morning we pray for the young persons. We pray for the, all those who, who live alone, Lord God and are seeking companionship, Lord. We pray for the the elderly or the aged, Lord God. We pray for the newly born, both physical and spiritual. We pray for the absent, Lord God, not just only those who may not be in attendance today here physically or watching online, but those who are just absent from everyday life, from from, from just not, not present, Lord God. We pray for those who are traveling. We pray for those we love. We pray for the the person, that man, woman, boy, or girl who might be in trouble, Lord God, right now, wherever they are, those who are bereaving. We pray for any sick person. We pray for recovery from sickness in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We also pray for any sick child, Lord. We we pray for um, any operation or medical procedure that may be going on this, this week, Lord God. We pray for the doctors. We ask that you guide their hands, Lord. We pray for strength and confidence. Lord, we, we, we pray and ask for so many different things, Lord, because you, you prompt us to, Lord. You say that we can come to you boldly and approach your throne, Lord God. And so we just bring all these things that are heavy on our heart. I also pray this morning, Lord, for fresh beginnings of recovery, for those who are addicted to whatever it might be. We pray for the oppressed this morning. We pray for our marriages. We pray for the lost that they may be found. We pray for our witness and our ability to represent you with excellence, Lord God. We pray for the Orchard Community Church this morning. We pray for our pastors 
our leaders, our elders, all of our volunteers, Lord God. We pray for all those who are listening who don't have a relationship with you. Oh God, who's, who, who may be acting or those who are seeking, those who are running away from you. We pray for them. God, we know that you can make a way out of no way. In the name of your son, Jesus, oh God, please, Lord, we right now recognize your provision is greater uh, than anything we could imagine. Lord, we think about our financial need and our resources, oh God, but you take care, you take care of that, Lord. You, you, you do that. You do that to the birds, oh God. You have that covered. But this morning, as we think, I think about how you connect the dots in our life, um, how you always remember us. You're const we're constantly on your mind, oh God, and we thank you for that. And as we continue to worship you, Lord, um, this morning as we prepare to take our offering, Lord, we worship you with, with our offering, with our sacrifice of praise, with 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 our, our finances, whatever it is, oh God, we give it to you this morning. So as I ask the ushers to take their place, Lord God, I just um, pray that, that whatever it is that, that we bring here this morning, that, that we leave it, Lord God, and that we don't leave here like we came. And that this be a pleasing aroma to you this morning, oh God. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my.
Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everybody. My name's Dennis. I'm a friend of Pastor Assad and Pastor Arnell, friend of Orchard Church, and I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'd like to begin our time um, asking you a question. How many of you tend to remember your failures more than your successes? And I think a lot of us are in that, in that camp. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a half-empty uh, glass kind of a person. Uh, the, the issue becomes if that thinking develops into the thought that once a failure, always a failure. I call that affectionately stinking thinking. It's a thought that gets into my head that doesn't build me up, but it just tears me down. Well, if you're in that camp, know this. According to our text of of study, God wants you to know that there is hope that your life can be different. The glass can become half full. So let's take a look at it together. Open your Bibles, please. Judges chapter 13. We're continuing our study of ancient heroes We're going to be looking this morning at a guy by the name of Samson. Are you familiar with Samson? I think a lot of people have heard his names. His story is told in Judges chapters 13 through 16. Here's just a little quick little background. Uh, Judges were the leaders of ancient Israel, both women and men. Before Israel had a king... The spiritual lives, political lives, financial lives, etc., of the nation were directed by judges. And according to this book, sometimes the Hebrew people listened to their judges, a lot of times they didn't. And as a result of not listening to the judges, they fell into a horrible cycle. And that's what the book of Judges records for us. This cycle of sin to where the Hebrew people, they followed the Lord, they'd listened to the Lord, but then they started compromising. And as a result, they sinned, they walked away from the Lord, they didn't listen to the word of the Lord through the judges. Well, when they did that, God disciplined them by sending a foreign army to conquer them and enslave the people. Well, once the Hebrew people were enslaved, they started to, what are we doing? How do we get here? Lord, I have messed up. I'm really sorry. And so we read a lot of them repenting. Well, God hears the prayers of his people. And in response to their prayers, he raised up these judges who would then lead the people back into a right relationship with God and throw off the yoke of a foreign uh, uh, oppressor. That cycle is repeated seven times in the book of Judges. Samson is the judge during that seventh cycle. All right? Now, what do we learn from him? Let's dig into our text now. Judges chapter 13, verse 1. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. So there's the oppression. The Philistines are this red area on this map right along the Mediterranean Sea. Today it's the area known as Palestine. And if you read anything in the news, rockets from Gaza and the Gaza Strip, that's that red strip of land there. Well, for 40 years at this time in Israel's history, that little red strip controlled all of Israel. Four decades. Uh, They took the Hebrews' money. They took the Hebrews' food. They took the Hebrews' weapons. They were oppressors during this time. And it was because of that that our Lord then raised up Samson. Verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah, family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bore no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold now, you're barren and bore no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. 
Now, therefore, be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Say that word, Nazarite. The word means separated. And that's what the whole no razor to his head was all about. This kid was to never drink beer or any kind of spirits, any kind of hard liquor, none of that. He was never to eat any food that God considered unclean in his word. He could never touch anything dead. And probably most interesting, he was to never get a haircut. Imagine somebody never cutting their hair, ever. I mean, that guy with really, really long hair. Why all those restrictions? It was a way that Samson in the culture would look very different from everybody else. And it was God's way of saying, he is different because he's mine. He's a Nazarite to God. He's been set apart. He belongs to me. And the reason why God did all of that is because God had a purpose for Samson. Verse 5. And he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Samson was going to be a judge. Now, the thing that's unique about him Samson doesn't lead an army of Hebrews against the Philistines. He's going to be a one-man army. That's what's unique about him. He's all by himself. And the reason for that, it appears that the Hebrew people kind of liked being under the control of the Philistines. They liked all those moral values of the Philistines. But they were God's people. And so God's going to raise up this one-man wrecking crew. And uh, we know uh, that his name, down verse 24, then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. The name Samson means like the son, S-U-N. Uh, we would uh, maybe define it as son child. Maybe they called him Sonny, you know, for short. Now, let me ask you, uh, you have heard of Samson before, what do he look like? Yeah, pretty. Is that the perception that you have of him? Aquaman. Yeah, Aquaman. You okay? I'm thinking he looks like The Rock. He's Dwayne Johnson ish. See this guy? This is the way that he looks in magazines or comic books or movies and stuff like that. This guy is ripped. He looks like he's on steroids. He's got all the veins are popping out of him. And that's the way most people perceive Samson. The problem with that is there's nothing in the text that tells us what he looked like. Nothing. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of clues. He didn't look anything like that. As a matter of fact, he probably looked like this. A long-haired, skinny white guy who liked puzzles. He likes word games. He likes riddles. This guy would have been great at first-person shooter video games. He, this, was, this was his thing. What do you think? Samson that? Or is Samson this? And the reason why I think personally he looked like this skinny guy, long hair, kind of a nerdy geek guy, kind of a guy, is nobody knew when his power was going to go off. You get around this guy, you're always thinking, he's going to take my head off. You get around this guy, and what do you think? I have no problem with this guy. And that's why we read verse 24. The child grew up, the Lord blessed him, 
and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtaol. The Spirit began to stir him, to impel, compel, control, empower, enable him. And it's really, really important to keep in mind, because we're going to read about Samson's hair a lot. His power was never in his hair. His power was in the Holy Spirit. And it's only when the Holy Spirit had control of Samson could he do anything. Only when the Holy Spirit was there. And the same thing is true for you, me, and us. You know, if we have in our minds that we're like the rock, that we're like Dwayne Johnson, yeah, we might not need God's help much. Look, we got all... But if we see ourselves as kind of a nerdy, long-haired, geeky kind of, kind of person, I can't do that. I need God's help. And this is why you're reading a scripture time and again that it's not going to be by your might that you're going to follow the Lord. It's not going to be by your power. It's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the New Testament reiterates it. If we walk by the Spirit, we won't carry out all those desires of the flesh. If we don't walk under the power of the Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? The cycle of sin. We're going to follow the Lord, then we're going to rebel against the Lord, we're going to not just not care, and it's going to come back to bite us in the backside. We're going to call out to the Lord, Lord help me, the Lord will forgive us, get us back on the right, but then we're going to fall away, and we're just going to go through this. And life seems like there's never breaking of the cycle, and all the things they tell me about God, and about Jesus, and following him, and the blessings that come, I'm not getting it, and we're just stuck. It's a lot of personal application to us. These ancient heroes, not just information from the past. It's stuff for you, me, and us today. See? So, you know, Samson, he's unstoppable when God the Holy Spirit is upon him. The problem was... He didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. He struggles, big time. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then Samson went down to Timnah, saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. He's going to go and marry some pagan woman. He's totally forgotten that he's a Nazarite, that he's separated from God. He forgets it. His parents, they try to talk some sense into him. Verse 3, father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Isn't there a nice Hebrew girl? Part of the covenant people of God, part of our faith. Isn't there some woman? In other words, do you have to sin against God? Verse 3, Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. What's he doing? He's not thinking. He's just reacting. This is not about his mind. This is about his hormones. Well, this is not about right and wrong. This is about his sexual desires. I see that woman. I want her. Go get her for me. Now, it's interesting here. Uh, parents, you can do everything right and your kids can still mess up. You can teach them. You can train them. You pray for them, send them to school, take them to church, be your best model. You can do everything right, and they can still say, I don't want to follow. 
Self-will is the trump card. And that's what Samson plays here. No thanks, I'm not doing it your way, I'm going the other way. So we can pull the guilt out of parenting. Our kids got to make up their minds. Samson is making up his mind here. The key thing to remember, though, is when Samson walks away, and he just following uh, his sexual desires as opposed to his moral desires, it really messes up his life. Really messes it up. Consequences are real. But God's sovereignty is stronger, and he can even use our bad decisions to accomplish something good in the process. It hurts us. We get into that cycle of sin, and you, it's really going to hurt you. But it doesn't mean you'll be a complete failure in life. Understand that? Because that's what happens here. Verse 4, however, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. He's going to use this choice to marry this Philistine girl to throw off the yoke of the Philistines from the Hebrew people. And that's what happens here. And Solomon, uh, uh, Samson, verse 5, Samson went down to Timnah, his father and his mother came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. Behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. Can you imagine a lion running at uh, Dwayne Johnson at the rock? And you can almost see him. The rock's a monster, okay? You can almost see him grabbing that thing and doing that with it, right? Might happen. How about this guy? That guy is never going to tear a lion apart, is he? Well, the answer is he is when the Holy Spirit's power is upon him. See, the problem was nobody knew when the Holy Spirit's power was going to come upon him. And so this little guy, he goes down after he does this, he goes down, marries this woman, uh, ends up uh, telling him a riddle. They figure out the riddle. So Sam, uh, Samson has to go and kill 30 Philistines in order to pay the vow that he had made. So God uses it to throw the yoke off. Uh, Samson leaves his wife. Philistines come in. They kill the wife, her father, and burn their uh, house down and their fields down. Samson hears about it, comes back, kills all of those guys. Chapter 14. Chapter 15, um, this guy kills 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, could you see uh, Dwayne Johnson? One of the big, kind of like a sword-like thing in his hand, and going out and just, psh, you kind of come, well, he might be able to do some damage. How about this guy? A thousand soldiers this guy takes out. Crazy, huh? When the power of the Spirit came upon him, there's no stopping this guy. He gets caught in a city. This guy goes down, yanks the doors of the city, the gates, big honk, these big, huge gates, puts them on his shoulders, carries them 38 miles, and puts them at the top of a hill. This guy. Samson is unstoppable when the Holy Spirit came upon him. The problem? 
is that Samson became numb to the Holy Spirit. That's chapter 16. See it with me? After this, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Say Delilah. 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 We know about Delilah. We, we've heard this story before. And you'd think that Samson would have learned his lesson. He's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. We can all say that out loud. And he's just going to fall over and over and over again to this sin. He's hanging out with prostitutes. He's falling in love with all these foreign women. Delilah is in it. She tricks him to telling her about his strength. Verse 17. So he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, A razor uh, has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I'm shaved, then all my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. Now, was that true? Kind of. Yes and no. Was his strength in his hair? His strength was never in his hair. But his strength was what? In, in what his hair represented, that he was a Nazarite. And by telling her, just go ahead and cut my hair off, what's he saying? I don't care about being a Nazarite. I just don't care. I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. I'm just going to do my own thing, so go ahead and cut my hair off. And that's what she does. Verse 20. Delilah cries out, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Completely unaware. Numb. Any numbness in your life spiritually? You know. You don't talk to the Lord, you don't listen to the Lord, just kind of, just kind of doing your own thing. And he just didn't realize that his compromise just meant forfeiting God's power in his life. And it cost him. Verse 21, the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza, bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. So he just becomes like an animal down there. They poke his eyes out. I, I, we can just say it out loud. Samson is a total and complete failure. until he repents. Verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. Was his strength in his hair? No. His hair represented his heart. The hair begins to grow. No razor comes upon his head. He's not any eating any unclean food. He's not touching dead bodies. He's not His heart begins to soften to the Lord again. I really am a Nazarite. I really am set apart for God. God really does have a plan for my life, and I want to follow it no matter what. And so, the end of Samson's story, Philistines throw a big party. 3,000 of their leaders get together in a pagan temple. They're all drinking and they say, hey, but let's bring that Samson guy out here and let's make fun of him. Kind of like a clown. Let him entertain us. And so they bring this skinny little guy out. Verse 28. Samson called to the Lord and said, oh, Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me just this time, oh God, that my, I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. So they put him in between two pillars. 
God heard his prayer. Verse 29, Samson grabbed the two metal pillars on which the house rested, braced himself against them. Again, this is the skinny guy. And then the one with his right hand, the other with his left, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. There it is. What's the lesson? Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Did you? You want a word from the Lord this morning? There it is. Our life final chapter hasn't yet been written. All right? This year I, I celebrate my 50th spiritual birthday. Walked with the Lord for 50 years. Praise the Lord. It's no guarantee that I'll walk with the Lord tomorrow. Final chapter of my life hasn't yet been written. You maybe have walked closely with the Lord, and maybe you have wandered away. That's yesterday. Tomorrow's the future. All you have is today. And so you have to choose. What are you going to do? You're going to let the Holy Spirit control you, or are you going to do it? Are you going to think of yourself as Dwayne Johnson? I got this. I can do this. No problem. I'm under control. I'll... Or do you understand that without the Holy Spirit's help, we are going to mess this up? And there's a time and a place to come back to and say, Lord, man, I have made a mess. That's the repentance. I'm sorry, forgive me. That choice determines how we're going to live our lives and what the final chapter will be. Okay, real quickly. What do we learn? First, heroes of the faith are imperfect people. You can be a hero of the faith, even if you've got some character flaws. Samson's got a terrible one. What you just have to understand is that God's power shows up best in imperfect people. So, final chapter hasn't yet been written. You may have made a just made a mess. Welcome to the club. What you have to do is come to grips with your pride. And that's what happens here. Samson thinks he can compromise and not have it bite him. And he was really wrong. It cost him his two eyes. And so you think, ah, well, you know, a little compromise is going to hurt me. A little pornography is not going to hurt me. Tell them my spouse, my folks, whatever, a little lie, not going to hurt us. You don't think it's going to hurt you, but it will. A prudent person will look out at that evil and say, I've got to get away from that. But somebody who's naive, someone who thinks, oh, man, I got this, that's what Samson's story was. And they just go running into the trouble. And oh, I'll be fine. I'll get out of this like I always have. It doesn't work that way. And so, what we have to do is just learn from the Lord. He loves us, so when we wander away, he's going to bring something into our lives that we just have to learn from. And you can do everything right, still have some challenges in your life. God wants to teach you. He's going to use it all. And he does it not because he's angry at you, He's not punishing you. God is not um, retaliatory in justice to his children. He's redemptive. And so whatever you got going on, the hardship you got going on, God wants to use it to instruct you. And 
So we just have to learn from it. Lord, teach me, show me what you want me to learn. I'm sorry, I've wandered, forgive me. Not because he's, he hates you. It's not because he's ticked off and angry. He's going to slap you. He loves you. I used to tell my kids, you're either going to learn through the ear or you're going to learn through the rear. It's your choice. That's what God says to us. Are you going to hear the whisper or are you going to hear the shout? And so, whatever the next phase of your life is, finish strong. If the next phase is college for you or high school or finishing school, finish strong. If the next phase is work, finish strong. Go hard at it. Those of us who are a little bit more mature, let's finish strong. Well, let's not let the past dictate choices that I make today. Remember, a failure in the past is a life lesson. It is not a life sentence. Why? because of the grace of God that's bigger than any sin I, you, we have ever committed. And that's the hope. It's why we are Christian, not because we got it all together. It's because we're all messed up and we need Jesus at every turn. How appropriate that we come to the Lord's table. So let me invite you to put your things away and Chris, come on up and lead us and let's prepare for communion in the Lord's table. Good morning, Orchard Church. Um, if we haven't gotten a chance to meet before, my name is Chris. Um, I serve, I'm a volunteer here, but I serve on a couple different teams. I serve on the communion team. I serve um, on the operations team. Um, and I have the uh, privilege of getting to kind of follow Dennis and um, help lead us to the Lord's table. I ask them to keep up this slide. We normally have a very nice communion slide because I like the tension of where Dennis's message leaves us. I don't, I don't know where in the judge's cycle you may be feeling today. Um, and I don't know that if you're like me, um, you're much better at looking at your flaws and your failures and bringing those to mind than um, the times that you've had success. Um, and you may say to me, Chris, you don't know the things that I have done. And I will tell you, you're right, I don't. But the God that made you does. And that God made a way for you to come home. So that's a lesson that comes over and over again. It's the God who makes a way to build a tabernacle so he can be among his people, that then later gives way to a temple so that he can dwell among his nation. It comes in the man Jesus Christ, who dwells in habits and tabernacles among his people, and then ultimately his death, burial, and resurrection that allows us to draw near that in the end, we can dwell in the life-giving presence of God forever. So that's why I asked them to, to leave that up, because uh, failure in the past is a life lesson. It's not a life sentence. And so I don't know what you're working through today, but I know that God made the way so that you can come to the table. That today, we can proclaim the Lord's death and uh, uh, be, be reconciled and unified with Him. And so the, the verse that I want to uh, read this morning as we prepare to come, um, comes out of a Hebrews. I have a personal affinity for the book of Hebrews. Um, 
and I think this ties into what we're talking about this morning. So I'm going to pick up here in um, chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess because he who promised is faithful. The Lord's table is not about us. It's about the God who makes the way, the God who is faithful. I actually owe Deborah an apology in the first service. We were talking about, you didn't want heaven without us, and I miscredited as Rachel leading us in that, but that was actually Deborah. So, um, but that's that's what this is about. So, um, whatever you're working through, I'd invite you to spend the next uh, little bit to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward and uh, pass out the elements. If this is the first time that you've ever taken communion with us uh, at the Orchard Church, um, the communion and the Lord's table is open to any um, believers. Um, we would ask. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we would ask that you uh, hold the elements and that, um, take a moment of silence, and then we will take all the elements together as one family, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, together. So. Our communion reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, um, picking up in chapter 11. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you today. As a church, we come to 
bless your name to give our um, love and hope and glory, and we place it all at your feet. We are grateful for the love and sacrifice of your son, that you are the God who makes a way that we can now enter boldly into the holy presence, to your life-giving presence, that we, we may dwell with you forever. As the psalmist David writes, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in your holy presence? Only the righteous and blameless. And Father, we recognize that that is not us, but you made the way. You came to us to rescue us back. So we ask your holy presence and your Holy Spirit, empower us, give us the strength that we may carry your name with honor and with your blessing to the people around us. It is in your Son's mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand as we sing this last song together?
if that's your hope, say amen. amen. All right, here's our benediction, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we uh, at the Orchard, we can be a friendly church, can't we? Yeah, say hi to several people before you head out. There's coffee out there. Praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. I'll be down front if I can be of any help.